Good evening, everybody. I, I haven't gotten the high sign, but I'm assuming since the light is in my face and the micro microphone seems to be working, we can get started. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you all to the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. I am uh, the dean of the Humphrey School, uh, Eric Schwartz, and um, we are uh, very pleased uh, to have um, Elliot Abrams join us tonight for um, a uh, 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 presentation on uh, the Arab Spring, and we'll, um, we'll have the opportunity uh, to hear from uh, Elliot, and then uh, we'll have a conversation uh, uh, with him. Uh, my colleague, uh, the faculty uh, at the Humphrey School, Raghi Assad, will uh, join me on stage uh, with Mr. Abrams, and we'll have a conversation. Um, um, and um, and then we'll uh, take questions uh, from the audience. But to introduce, uh, since this is a, an event that is jointly sponsored between the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and uh, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Minnesota and Dakotas, uh, to introduce uh, uh, Elliot, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the executive director of the JCRC, Steve Hunix. Steve. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dean Schwartz, for your leadership at the Humphreys School. We appreciate very much the opportunity to partner with you and the school and to hear and learn from Elliot Abrams. We're also proud of your service on our JCRC board. You always bring us a wealth of experience on a variety of issues that we face and discuss and work on all the time. And we thank your outstanding staff for all of its hard work, intelligence in particular, Annette Towsley, and Laura Bloomberg, and for everybody's efforts in making this effort possible, and thank you all for coming tonight. We join also in your welcoming of Mr. Abrams to the university and to our community. Our timing's impeccable for his appearance and his remarks tonight. When you think back on it, the, since the high watermark of the Arab Spring, so much has happened in the world and in the Middle East, which requires us to evaluate the meaning of events once once rocked the Arab world from Tunisia to Egypt to the Arabian Peninsula to Syria. The more things seem to change, the more they stay the same, or so it may seem, in the Middle East. But of course, that's probably a mirage, so to speak, and we'll hear from you tonight just about the Arab Spring. And the question may be, so where are we and where are they? And to this question, Mr. Abrams brings a wealth of experience in his career and his life. During the Reagan administration, Mr. Abrams served as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. He played an important role in convincing the Reagan administration to include human rights in the conduct of foreign policy. During the administration of George W. Bush, Mr. Abrams served as a Senior Director of the National Security Council for Near East and North American Affairs. He was promoted to Deputy National Security Advisor for Global Democratic Strategy. Obviously, Mr. Abrams brings a wealth of experience and knowledge, and having heard him at dinner tonight, he's a fascinating personality and a wonderfully spoken person. I'd also like to welcome Judge Jack Thunheim, Justice David Strauss, and Dean Brian Atwood tonight, other distinguished guests. Of course, Dean Atwood is a former dean of this distinguished school. Bringing thought leaders on Middle East issues to the upper Midwest is an important JCRC function. In March, we hosted Ari Shavit with Mount Zion, in St. Paul, and that was a fascinating morning and afternoon. So between Ari Shavit and Elliot Abrams, we're fortunate to have such remarkable expertise brought to bear in the Twin Cities. So please join the JCRC and the Hubert H. Humphrey School for Public Affairs <clears throat> and Dean Schwartz in welcoming Elliot Abrams to the Twin Cities and to this podium. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. It's really um, it's a pleasure to be here, I should say, to be back here um, in the Twin Cities. Uh, my late wife's uh, family was from here, actually, and she um, had many stories of summers at White Bear Lake um, some years ago. Um, and it's always great to be with uh, Eric Schwartz, whose successor I was, actually, 
uh, when the Bush administration started, uh, I joined the NSC in the job handling um, human rights and democracy and um, taking it over from him. Um, I should also say it's a particular pleasure to be at the Humphrey School. When I was a kid, little kid, um, I remember the 1960 election very well because I was for Humphrey. I wasn't for this guy, Kennedy. And I remember asking my parents how it could be that this man, Joseph Kennedy, had bought the West Virginia primary. What did that mean? How do you buy a primary? Now I know. Um, <laughs> but um, I then, I then uh, supported Humphrey a little bit older. I was in college, actually, in 1968. And when I moved to Washington and joined the staff as Senator Henry M. Jackson, got to um, meet Senator Humphrey uh, many times. What I want to talk about tonight here is the Arab Spring. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty short um, and not very sweet. Um, really a brief moment of hope. And now most people would say we're in the Arab winter. Um, and so now we hear more and more often an older refrain. You know, forget democracy in the Middle East. Uh, right? In fact, I mean, opening the political systems in these countries just leads to takeovers by extremists. It's, I mean, better Mubarak and the army than the Muslim Brotherhood, right? And I want to argue today that that view is wrong. Not at all right. Um, so let me begin with what, what was the Arab Spring? And then why it has gone more wrong than right in most places. And then I want to turn to the question, so what do we do about it? Uh, what should American policy be? Um, this will only take three to four hours, so just relax, <laughs> comfortable. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can. What was the Arab Spring? I think the important thing is it was a series of revolts. These were uprisings against illegitimate rulers, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Syria. In all of those, the form of government was what I would call a fake Republic, uh, fake elections, fake rubber stamp uh, parliament, um, one man in charge. Moreover, in each case, Mubarak and his son Gamal, um, Hafez al-Assad followed, followed by Bashar al-Assad in Syria, Gaddafi and his sons, and Ben Ali and his family in Tunisia, in each of these cases there was an effort to turn these fake republics into a kind of fake monarchy with permanent family rule. Those regimes did not have the partial, and in some cases pretty widespread, legitimacy that real monarchies have in the Arab world, still have. Nor could those fake republics claim to govern effectively bringing prosperity and modernization the way the government of China can claim to have done. Um, those guys ruled by brute force, period. And in Syria, the regime continues to rule by brute force, killing as many Syrians as it thinks it has to kill to stay in power. What was the purpose of the uprisings? What was the goal of these uprisings? The goal was to bring down the government. They didn't have a common view of, then what? What comes next? Sharia, liberal democracy, secularism, federalism, they had no agreement at all. Uh, the Arab Spring is, in that sense, I think, better called the Arab revolts or the Arab uprisings, because what characterizes them and similar movements in some other countries is they were against something, much more than they were for something. They were against the status quo. Um, and those in revolt have had a very hard time coming together on a set of common goals. Um, moreover, there was really no... Um, there have been no mechanisms for them to use. For example, best example, no established democratic political parties. Why not? Why have there not been democratic parties and mechanisms? Uh, because Arabs can't do democracy? Because Muslims can't do democracy? No. No, because the regimes they overthrew carefully and methodically destroyed such institutions. Take Mubarak, for example, in Egypt. 
Mubarak did not destroy the Muslim Brotherhood, nor did he try to destroy the Muslim Brotherhood. He allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to get 88 seats in parliament in the 2005 parliamentary elections, the last held while he was in power. 88 seats in parliament, that's hardly destroying the Muslim Brotherhood. When he fell, the entire leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt was living in Cairo safely and in many cases uh, quite prosperously. Instead, these regimes tried to kill off what they understood as ultimately more dangerous, an ultimately more dangerous form of opposition, and that's the centrist, liberal, moderate, secular, democratic forces. Example, Ayman Noor, the Egyptian political leader, ran against Mubarak in 2005, as soon as the election was over, sent to jail. And he was a moderate and a centrist. So these democratic groups are starting largely from scratch. Now, in many countries, there are civil society groups of various kind, human rights groups, for example. And the US and the European Union, through our democracy programs, very often supports them. It's a good thing to do. But NGOs and civil society groups are not fundamentally what's needed. Political groups and democratic political parties are what's needed to build a democratic society and government. And those are very often too weak or just absent. I think the argument that you know, Muslims can't do democracy, um, Islam is against democracy, is quite odd when you look at countries like Senegal, Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh. None has a perfect record and all have struggled, but all are progressing toward more stable democratic systems. The Arab case is harder. Where are the democratic models? Uh, for decades, the answer was, well, there's Lebanon. But the Hezbollah role in Lebanon makes it questionable whether that can really be cited. Is Lebanon today really a democracy? And anyway, Lebanon is sufficiently Christian to be atypical for the region. But more recently, the answer was nowhere. There's no model. There's no Arab democracy until now, Tunisia. Tunisia looks like it's going to end that drought. Tunisians appear able to work through their problems. They've adopted a new constitution. And they really seem like they're headed for a genuinely democratic government. But I would still agree. The Arab case is the toughest case on the globe. Why the dearth of Arab democracies? Many scholars have addressed this question. There's no agreed answer. Uh, war and instability in the region is sometimes suggested as the cause. Some people say Islam. Some people say Arab culture, uh, including the denigration of women and their role in society and including the widespread conspiracy theories. Some people suggest, no, no, you've got to go back to the Ottoman Empire. It's the Ottoman, Ottoman model of absolutism. Others will say, well, that plus colonialism. And the more I read about that subject, the more it seems clear that no scholars, at least that I've seen, have put forward a fully adequate theory. And now, of course, the theory has to also accommodate success in one place, Tunisia. But even without a comprehensive theory, there are some things I think we can say First, the example of Tunisia shows that whatever the obstacles are in the Arab world, they can sometimes be overcome. Second, I think it is not inevitable that the opening of political systems results inevitably in Islamist rule. Uh, why did that happen in Egypt, and why are Islamist parties so prominent in other countries as well? Well, I think a clear reason is that during the dictatorships, only they could really organize. Democrats were crushed as they were not. Only around the mosque, it seems, was it safe to gather and conspire. And that's one important reason why they, the Islamist groups, tend to emerge from periods of oppression intact, organized, ready to roll, ready to roll. There are other reasons, such as the the social services they provide, and their reputation for integrity. But I think we should focus on that word reputation, their reputation for integrity. It's critical. 
it's not at all clear that Islamist groups actually provide medical or educational services very widely compared with what's provided by the state itself, but they have a reputation for doing so and doing it efficiently. They also have a reputation for general integrity, uh, commitment to principle, financial integrity, you know, simply not being a bunch of dirty politicians. But you know, it's easy, all that is easy when you have no share in power anyway. There are very few temptations. What happens when they get a share of power? What happens when they take all of it, as Morsi did in Egypt? I think we've seen the answer in Egypt pretty clearly. They quickly lose their shine. Their sterling reputations start to be riddled with allegations or experiences of inefficiency, ineffectiveness, corruption. As we saw when President Morsi in Egypt failed to improve the economy or to improve the human rights situation. We see it now in Gaza where Hamas has worn away much of its popularity. Fairly quickly, the reputation can dissipate or be turned on its head. Marwan Mouasher, the former uh, prime minister, excuse me, foreign minister of Jordan, uh, wrote a book called The Second Arab Awakening and the Battle for Pluralism. And he put it this way, success in the first ever elections will not necessarily translate into permanent control. Their promise of better governance, which has helped attract the support of many Arabs fed up with the status quo, is now being put to the test. As they enter the political fray, this time as decision makers, their perceived holiness will be confronted with reality and their ability to deliver will be established." Close quote. And we've seen that uh, not only in Egypt, but in Asia as well. We've seen other cases where Islamist groups do very well in the first post-dictatorship election, but not the subsequent ones. The lesson is that, that it's neither obvious nor inevitable that political openings lead to Islamist rule. They may, they may, especially if we do nothing useful to prevent it. So what might be useful? The obvious answer is that political openings should begin immediately but progress slowly. The kind of reform we in the US government had in mind actually in 2005 in Egypt, for example. 2005, Mubarak was running for president again. But you know, he'd never actually been elected president by the people of Egypt, not even in a phony election. He'd been elected by the parliament. So we pushed him very hard, demanding an election. Uh, and in 2005, he agreed to do it. He changed the Constitution to allow an election. Of course, it was not a free election. But he did change the Constitution to, give, to have direct election of the president. And we thought, well, you know, Mubarak's about 80. He's not going to be running again. So in five years, there'll be another election that can be not only direct, but maybe for the first time free, really free. This was a step in that direction. Uh, even the parliamentary elections in Egypt in 2005 started out pretty free. They had three rounds. First round was actually pretty close to free, but Mubarak didn't like the result. So the second round, the police showed up and they cracked down a fair amount. Uh, he didn't like that result either. So the third round was really bad. I mean, the third round was not at all free. But our view was, but it's a lesson for the Egyptian people. And the next parliamentary elections post-Mubarak maybe will be free. An instant political opening can sometimes bring chaos or Islamist victories when there's been no foundation laid and no opportunity for Democrats to organize. I remember very well a meeting I had in the, uh, in the White House in 2003 with a, an Egyptian um, political activist, democracy activist, and she said to me she actually did not favor free elections in Egypt immediately. Right then, in 2003, she said, I would actually like to have free elections in about 10 years, if I can have those 10 years to really organize a political party that can catch up with the Muslim Brotherhood. In the book, Political Liberalization and Democratization in the Arab World, the Israeli uh, scholar Gabriel Ben-Dor notes that when dictatorships end, it's often the case, uh, quote, that 
there are no authentic mass movements other than Islamic fundamentalism, close quote. So that's who wins. I mean, as he puts it, quote, it simply preempts the center of political activity when the masses are brought in, as they inevitably are in general election. And as long as alternative ideological forces continue to be weak, this is not likely to change, close quote. Now, pessimists will argue, well, it's never likely to change. It's never going to change. But then, of course, the pessimists have to answer the question of Tunisia, where it did change. And they have to explain Egypt, where the people turned away from the Muslim Brotherhood. The obvious goal for Democrats, then, is to create that alternative to the Islamist ideology, the alternative I think we would call democracy. And then to organize political movements and parties around it. And that has proved really hard. And our support for NGOs and for civil society is not the solution. Civil society and NGOs are one thing. Winning elections through democratic political parties is something else. In fact, recently an Egyptian political activist said to me, you guys, you Americans, have been so strongly supporting civil society organizations and NGOs, giving them so much money, that people who would otherwise be in politics go to those because that's where the money is and they can get salaries. That is not the answer. We need to figure out how to do this, how we can be more helpful to democratic political activists, political actors seeking to organize parties and movements around the ideas of liberty under law, liberty under man-made law. We also learn from this something that's neither new nor surprising. Gradual reform is safer. And that's something we should be telling our friends throughout the Arab world, including the monarchies. You know, no monarchy has been overthrown as part of these Arab revolts. Bahrain has come the closest for the obvious reason that the royal family is Sunni, but the bulk of the population is Shia. Um, and Bahrain is actually the best example, I think, today of what happens when you resist moderate reform. If the system doesn't bend, in that case does not accommodate Shia political participation, it's going to break at some point. In the other Arab monarchies, there, there's, a, there's a range of practices. Kuwait has a real parliament, a real elected parliament with real power. Um, in Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, um, Qatar, no parliament, nothing. Not even a fake parliament. Jordan and Morocco have real elected parliaments, but power remains in the palace. Uh, at times, it seems that both of those kings, Jordan and Morocco, do plan um, a slow but steady move toward constitutional monarchy. Sometimes. Sometimes it looks as if both of them have undertaken this as a kind of ruse to fool us, the Americans, um, keep the populace quiet, keep their politicians quiet, keep us quiet. Um, that had better not be true. It had better not be phony reform. Both of those countries, I think, would be able to move safely toward, toward greater and greater democracy under a monarchical system. And they'll be able to do it more safely than they would if there were no king. But in the long run, if the kings try to retain 100% of power, they may end up with zero. Why would that be? Because I think something's changed in the region. It's been a long time coming. It didn't just start with you know, the Arab Spring a couple of years ago. You can point, for one thing, to something that happened in 2002. Uh, the Arab Human Development Report, UN Development Program, got a bunch of Arab scholars and intellectuals together, and they produced a report, the Arab Human Development Report. And it's really a turning point. Um, it referred to the region's freedom deficit. That was where that phrase came from, freedom deficit, as the root of underdevelopment there. That is, the root of underdevelopment was not colonialism. It was not imperialism. It was not Zionism. It was the freedom deficit at home. And the report called for ending the lag between the Arab region and other parts of the world in participatory governance. 
Uh, President Bush weighed in in 2003 and 2005 with two very striking freedom agenda speeches. Um, the demolition of the Saddam Hussein terror regime probably helped as well. The Cedar Revolution in Lebanon, remember that? Was a great step forward, but then came Tunisia. Uh, and the demand, what was the demand? Justice and dignity. It was the assault on his dignity, December 17th, 2010, that led uh, Mohammed Bouazizi to set himself on fire and start the Arab revolt. Um, and those demands, justice and dignity, cannot be met in systems of oppression, of dictatorship, where people are subjects. They are not citizens. They're creatures of the state, and they have no rights at all. And that does not mean that every monarchy and every dictatorship is going to be overthrown. It does not mean, you know, democracy is around the corner. But I think it does mean that a return to the past is going to be difficult and efforts to return to the past are going to be unstable. For that reason, I do not think we should be cozying up to the military rulers in Egypt in the name of stability. You know, that's what we did with Mubarak. Stability. Then he was gone. Then came the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. We cozy it up to them. Why? Stability. Then they were gone. Then we cozy it up to Mohammed Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president, in the name of stability. He lasted a whole year. Um, just about everyone in Egypt now resents American policy because over time we've supported everybody's enemies at one point or another instead of supporting a consistent policy. And what is the stability being brought by the army in Egypt today? In fact, the instability, the instability in Egypt is unprecedented. Between last July and the end of January, which is when we have figures, it's not a very long time. Last July, end of January, more than 3,000 Egyptians have been killed, of whom 2,500 were civilians. More than 17,000 are estimated to have been wounded in 1,100 demonstrations and clashes. And there are 19,000 Egyptians in prison today for these so-called crimes. Now, the Egyptian army is trying hard today to crush the Muslim Brotherhood. But they're also trying hard to crush everyone else, to crush political life in Egypt, to prevent the development of that term participatory governance. You know, it can work for a while. It can work for a while. And if enough people want the Brotherhood hurt, and if the army can produce prosperity, but I have to say it's very unlikely that the army can produce prosperity. The army in Egypt owns so much of the economy that it's going to prevent real, thoroughgoing, uh, widespread economic reform. Uh, right now, they're living on aid from the Gulf countries, huge amounts of aid, $14 billion in the last year. But that is not going to continue at that level uh, indefinitely. What people in Egypt want may not be American-style democracy. Um, in other Arab countries, many royal families have considerable legitimacy. But I think what people will want is dignity and respect and justice and a role, an understanding that they are citizens with rights. And the spread of that view is, I think, the achievement of the, of the Arab Spring. Um, in Eastern Europe, you know, when the Soviet Empire collapsed, democracy was achieved quickly in several countries, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia. Why can't the Arabs do it? Well, you know, all those countries in Europe, the Baltic countries, had some experience of democracy. And they had a model and a magnet. And the model and magnet was the EU, which insisted on democracy as a price of joining. But, you know, even in Europe, I mean, Romania, Belarus, Ukraine, plenty of problems with democracy. In the Arab land, no experience of democracy, no EU-like model and magnet. It's going to be harder. So let me just close by saying, so what do we do? What should we do? The United States. First, we should not be giving lots of aid to their oppressors. We should not be indifferent to the oppression. We did that for a very long time, 30 years in Egypt. Of course, we're not to blame. Mubarak is to blame for crushing the democratic opposition. But I think you'd have to say we kind of aided and abetted him for most of his years in office. At best, we were indifferent. 
we should have learned the lesson that apparent stability is not the same as real stability. And second, we should be trying to give what help we can to the political actors who are trying to build democratic political parties. We can do this from, uh, through USAID, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, the National Democratic Party Institute, the International Republican Institute. We, can, we have allies who are trying to help on this, Japan, Australia, Canada, the EU. Uh, this is not the same as aid to NGOs and civil society groups. I'm talking about aid to political groups. Third, I think our leaders, especially the president, should use their voices to endorse and protect such people, democratic political actors, whenever we can. And sometimes that's best done privately. Uh, very often it has to be done publicly. The voice of any American president can be extremely powerful. You know, uh, in 2004 and five, there was a bit of a political opening in Egypt. It was harder to get yourself arrested for criticizing Mubarak. Newspapers could print more. Was that because our democracy programming changed? Was it because AID changed the way it spent money or the National Endowment for Democracy changed its programming? No, it wasn't. Same programming in 2002, three, four, five, six, as the political opening rose and then fell. So it wasn't the spending that did it. It was what they were hearing from the top, from the President and Secretary of State. At one point, I would say in 2004 and five, great pressure on democracy and human rights. 2007 and eight, a lot less pressure on democracy and human rights. That's what really made a greater difference. And when we appear indifferent to democracy, uh, Democrats suffer. When we seem committed, energetic, concerned, they benefit. Not everywhere, not always, but most of the time. And finally, we should be trying to protect the groups that will need special help even if democracy breaks out. Minorities. We Americans do not believe in a plebiscitarian winner-take-all system. We believe in liberty under law. We believe in constitutional protections of rights. So when it comes to Baha'is or Christians or Muslim minority groups, democracy is not enough of an answer unless accompanied by concepts of unbreakable rights under law. Now how, do you, you know, how we do this will vary from case to case, publicly, privately, using words, using aid programs, because the political situations differ. And the threatened minorities and their situation differ. But we and allies elsewhere in the democratic world have a real role to play here in the protection of minorities and the assertion that democracy is not just unlimited, untrammeled majority rule. A democratic system includes free elections and is impossible without them, but it includes more not least a constitutional system of law and justice that protects the rights of every citizen. So um, winter is, <laughs> I was about to say winter is ending here. In Washington it's ending. You guys have another foot of snow coming. Um, in, uh, we're in the Arab winter too. Uh, spring is a lot more certain here, even in Minnesota, than in the Arab world. The Arab spring may return but there are gonna be a lot of battles ahead against entrenched military, economic, and political interests, against majority groups that seek 100% of power, against traditions and practices that make real democracy a lot harder, sometimes against foreign influences that work against democracy. I think we have a moral obligation and a national interest in helping those citizens who are struggling for open, democratic, liberal political systems that protect the rights of all citizens in the Arab world. We still have enormous influence. We have aid programs in the billions of dollars. We have military alliances. We have some of the greatest bully pulpits in the world. We should use them. We should not walk away and say, well, you know, Arabs can't do democracy. If there's one lesson of the brief Arab Spring, it is that outcomes and trajectories are not inevitable and will vary greatly from country to country over time. To me, that suggests that an American policy of pessimism or indifference about Arab democracy would be a great mistake. Thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion.
you sit at, 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 yeah. uh, uh, at the end. There is water there. Okay, good. And, uh, yeah. All right. I'm just going to. Um, we'll start a, um, a conversation, and um, and and then after a brief conversation discussion, then we'll throw it open for questions. But I also want to reintroduce um, uh, Professor Raghi Assad of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. It's a real pleasure, Raghi, to welcome you uh, tonight. Raghi is, uh, uh, has many different areas of specialization. <laughs> um, include, he um, leads our Masters of Development Practice program here. Uh, he is an expert on um, labor issues in Egypt and has also written and spoken about the Arab Spring. So, a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Schwartz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abrams, for a, um, a very enlightening talk. I actually, uh, uh, I'm surprised to say it. I thought I would disagree with a lot of what you said, but in fact, I agree with much of what you said about the Arab Spring. Good, we can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> but I would actually like to go back and ask you a few questions about the when you were in the Bush administration and the decisions that the Bush administrations made, uh, and whether now, in, with the benefit of hindsight, you would make similar decisions or advise mm -hmm. the president to make similar decisions. Given what we know about uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, do you think that invading Iraq was worth it to achieve uh, the overthrow of the Saddam Hussein regime? or? Uh, uh, or is, it, is, it, is that an adequate or a good way to achieve democracy? Or uh, is it, uh, uh, would it have been better to let the Iraqi people uh, uh, liberate themselves? Well, I don't, think there was any, I don't think there was any possibility of them liberating themselves from that really monstrous um, regime. Um, whether it was worth it, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, you know the story about um, Kissinger and Zhou Enlai where they're discussing revolutions in the Chinese Revolution and, and Zhou Enlai makes some kind of statement about something and, and Kissinger says to him, well, if you think that, do you think the French Revolution was a failure or a success? And Zhou Enlai replied, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> if you, you know, now, uh, it's been some years, um, but if, if we look back, I don't know, five or 10 years from now, and Iraq is a bloody mess, it will be much easier to argue it was an unmitigated disaster. If Iraq moves in a direction of democracy, uh, less so. I talked, uh, I guess, with last week to uh, the US ambassador who uh, said, you know, there, there's a lot of democracy in Iraq. There are a lot of terrible problems, but there's a lot of politics and uh, also going on. Um, one of the mistakes, of course, was, well, I mean, the, the intelligence mistake was, was uh, the largest one. Um, it, we did not need to base the removal of that regime solely on weapons of mass destruction. We could have added arguments like human rights. Um, and I have to say, uh, I thought Secretary Powell was going to do that at the UN. He had a big portfolio of um, uh, I mean, it was easy from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty and everybody else about the unbelievable horrors in Iraq. And he didn't use it, which was, I think, unfortunate. But my uh, bottom line is not a bottom line. I'm just not sure. Can I um, jump in? I, I, that wasn't my intention. I, but, but on this last point you made, um, Elliot, I, I have some very strong views. And I wanted to um, get your perspective on it. Because as a human rights advocate, which I um, regard myself as one, um, and as someone who has um, been a, a proponent of the principle of the responsibility to protect, which is an international uh, um, 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 norm or an evolving norm that says when a government is, egreg is responsible for the egregious abuses and mass violations of human rights, it may be appropriate for the international community to step in. Um, but my own personal view, and I'd like your comment on this, is that that is precisely why the human rights justification for the intervention in Iraq was dead wrong. Because if you use that justification, you give intervention a bad name. You, 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 you play into the concern in the Arab world and elsewhere that for the United States, 
intervention to promote human rights is really intervention for whatever purpose the United States wants. And so whatever my discomfort about the intervention in Iraq was, I always, you know, I think limiting it to weapons of mass destruction in some sense was the only way to make the case. But if you make the case on human rights, then the issue is where does it end? And how do you avoid the perception in the Arab world that whenever the United States doesn't like a regime, it's going to use force to undermine the regime? Well, your, your question is, where does it end? I'll ask you a question in response. Where does it begin? Look at Syria. 150,000 dead, 6 million driven from their homes. Unbelievable, uh, let's add, use of chemical weapons. So. If there's not a responsibility to protect argument for intervening in Syria, when is there ever going to be one? And I'm going to respond to that, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> My response is, there is a, the strongest argument for the responsibility to protect in Syria, but our actions and our, just, and our human rights justifications for our actions in Iraq has undermined our position on Syria and has made it more difficult for us to muster international support for the kind of intervention that I think should happen in Syria. We, uh, that, so, that's my, that's my concern. Let, me add, uh, to let me add to that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, do you think that it's therefore justified to intervene in Syria today without UN approval? Should the US unilaterally decide that it has a responsibility to intervene and therefore it intervenes? Well, first, um, the notion that you can't bring democracy at the point of a bayonet is disproved by Germany and Japan. We brought democracy at the point of a bayonet. Um, in the case of uh, Syria, well, let's go, wait, let's go to Clinton in the Balkans. No UN. President Clinton acted in the Balkans without the UN, because of the Russians. Um, I think those interventions, Serbia, Kosovo, were the right thing to do. I'm glad President Clinton did it. So I don't take the position that if you can't get a UN resolution, you can't act. Now, acting in Syria, I mean, what does acting mean? Does acting mean invading Syria with 100,000 troops? Or does acting mean what I thought the president was going to do back at the end of the summer, which was to strike their chemical weapons and some other military um, units? Um, I would. But that probably wouldn't have stopped the killing. Well, it would have stopped. Um, depends on what you did. I mean, we're in a situation now where we have a government that really is killing limitless numbers of its citizens with these barrel bombs being dropped on apartment, apartment houses. Um, I don't know. Does the international community really have no responsibility here? Uh, I'm not so sure that, uh, by the way, that we, first of all, we didn't really use the, I think unfortunately, we didn't really use the human rights argument against Saddam Hussein. I'm not so sure that that makes it impossible to intervene in Syria. Certainly in the Arab world, we would be able to get considerable support. The Gulf Arabs, Jordan, we would also, I think, be able to get Turkey. Um, I think that if we led, we would be able to get the Europeans. So um, I am not so sure that what happened in Iraq would make it impossible to put together a coalition to try to um, stop the mass slaughter in Syria. You know, and the problem, I mean, we're making a joke out of never again. Well, let, let me follow up on something you said about the mistakes about weapons of mass destruction. I mean, uh, it seems to me a lot of people would say that those mistakes weren't coincidental, that there was a great deal of pressure, undue pressure, on the part of the politicians on the intelligence agencies to produce these very results. Well, I uh, think that's just false. I mean. You had a complete and absolute agreement, all wrong. The German intelligence agency, we're not in a position to tell them what to do. The British intelligence agency, the French intelligence agency. Uh, every intelligence agency in the West agreed that he was developing or had weapons of mass destruction. Um, I think, uh, I mean, you can entertain the theory, I think it would be wrong, but you can entertain the theory that any president can get the CIA to say what he wants them to say. I don't think that's true. Um, but the, a president does not have the ability to tell the French intelligence agency, you come out with the, so I just, I just don't think it's true. Well, the French weren't about go invading Iraq. In fact, quite, they were quite but, opposed but to it. The French Iraq. said, he's got weapons of mass destruction. The British said, he's got weapons of mass destruction. The Germans said, 
Absolutely. He's got, I mean, they all agree. Now, you mentioned in your talk that uh, the pressure on uh, the Mubarak regime uh, waned after the initial years of 2004, yeah. 2005, uh, when the Bush administration was still in power. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that was the case? Why did the Bush administration let up on the pressure on democracy? Was it because Hamas win, win, won an election in, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, and as a result, they saw the result of democracy was not very appetizing? No, I have a different explanation. It's a theory. I mean, I don't know if we can ever, you know, pin down the answer, but I'll give you my theory. Oddly enough, um, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Um, what happened after the Lebanon war in 2006, summer of 2006, um, Secretary Rice decided that she would make a very big push for an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. And we were going, I mean, she was back in, it's just like Secretary Kerry, in the, in the last, you know, year, uh, two and a half years of the administration. Trip after trip after trip. Now, if you decide you're going to go for an Israeli-Palestinian deal, then in those days, you really need Mubarak and his foreign minister. You need them to help get what you want out of the Arab League. Uh, you need them to say things you want them to say. You need them to pressure both Hamas and Fatah. Um, and that was the main project at that point, I think. Um, Israeli-Palestinian peace. And this business of uh, opening in Egypt has just pushed it yeah, aside. But a couple, of years, a couple of years earlier, she had made the famous comment that we had the wrong policy in the Middle East for 60 years. Right. We pursued stability rather than democracy, and that was made a in, major mistake. Made in Cairo. She said that in Cairo. And, and she said that it's okay if Islamists comes to power, let's go for, uh, I think she used the term uh, creative chaos as uh, it's okay if, if uh, that reversed two years later. What happened? I think what happened was the peace process. I think that the administration decided. So 50 years, admitting a, a mistake that lasted 50 years so openly can be reversed so easily because of tactical desire. Well, it's not for tactical it. desire. I think um, she thought it would be a great thing for the Israelis, the Palestinians, and the United States if we could achieve a peace deal, which it's not a very odd thing to believe. President Clinton believed it. President Obama, Secretary Kerry believe it. But you can't do that and still fight Mubarak, or at least that was the view. Um, can I, and by the way, we will, uh, we've got plenty of time. We'll go another maybe five, seven minutes, and then we'll, we'll throw it open to the, uh, the audience. So don't, don't worry. We're not forgetting about you. <laughs> um, if I may ask sure, a question. Sure, please. Um, um, Elliot, I want to take a step back because um, um, you know, I think your, your career um, um, demonstrates to me, um, without question, that you have a, a deep um, a commitment to a human rights and democracy. I mean, I, I, um, but, but I, I think in, in this discussion and more broadly, um, the, the, the issue is um, how you, you, you are prepared to um, pr um, promote that principle um, it, it, you know, in circumstances that, in, in ways that, that would leave, you know, people on the other side of this issue, human rights advocates, with some significant degree of discomfort. Um, a greater degree of um, unilateralism, um, 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 a, uh, a, 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 a willingness to use force um, to promote the principle, um, and, um, and, and, and the, the, the problem that a number of people ha uh, uh, have with it, the, the, the philosophical disagreement, frankly, that I think you and I probably have, is that the problem with that perspective is, first of all, um, it creates the impression in some parts of the world, uh, uh, it, it makes it more difficult for the United States to pursue those objectives because there's suspicion about our motives. But more importantly, in terms of international law and norms, it, it, it sort of speaks to the proposition of we're doing it 
you know, because it's the right thing to do. But if, if, we're, if we have that license, what prevents any other powerful country in the world to exercise um, that same license um, and w in circumstances where they may have very different motivations? And, um, um, you know, Saddam Hussein is a tyrant. We've got to overthrow him. We're going to overthrow him. Versus we need to think about what other governments think, and we need to do it in a way that is more broadly perceived as legal. Well, before I let you off the hook and answer that question, <laughs> therefore you believe President Clinton should not have acted in Serbia and Kosovo? That was I, an assertion of American power without UN legality behind it. Well, I, I would say that, that, that the, it, like everything in life, it's complex. And I would say the fact that 19 NATO countries supported the intervention is not irrelevant. The fact that the United, that the United States and the United Kingdom you know, um, you know, um, uh, struggled mightily to think about issues of legality and legitimacy. The fact that that whole effort actually resulted in, in some measure, in the discussion of this norm of the responsibility to co to protect. I think you have to accept the fact that it, that at least reflects a greater degree of concern about those issues. Now, well, you know, and so, yeah. so, so, so I know. don't accept that. Um, I think you're misremembering the opening of the Iraq War, um, okay. where the Brits were right there with us, as were a number of other countries, and we went to the United Nations, and we got these resolutions in the UN. So I think there's a kind of myth being made here about this um, intervention in Iraq being sort of dreamed up one night uh, without any international support, without going to the UN seeking support. Now, you know, um, sometimes it's easier to get it and sometimes it isn't. Libya, um, should the, what about the French in Mali? Good idea, bad idea. Yeah. I think there are a number of cases where, I mean, let, let, me, let me put the question as I, here's the answer to your okay. question, I guess. Well, let's just, We're, I mean, the wait. French in Mali were invited in by the Malian government <laughs> to come and support the government against rebels. Very different sort of intervention. Well, I'm not so sure it's a very <laughs> different sort of intervention. Um, what governments do and do not have the right to, I mean, for example, suppose you have a dictatorial regime that's never been elected. Does it have a right to invite you in? Who does it represent? But I, I want to make a point, which is there's one leader of the free world, and we're it. And we're in a world, and have been for a very long time, most of the last 100 years or so, where there are very powerful enemies of human rights and democracy. Uh, once upon a time, the Nazis. Once upon a time, the Soviet Union for 75 years. Um, now in, a, in, a, in China and others. Um, and there's one leader of the, the West. Um, so the question is really a tougher one for us because most often if we don't act, uh, the forces of democracy are going to be greatly weakened. So the question of when to act is a harder question for us than it is for, for anybody else. Um, and I think you have to be prepared um, to say to the people on the receiving end, I know you're under the jackboot. I know Saddam Hussein gassed you and killed tens of thousands. I know Assad is using chemical weapons. But you know, I'm not going to do anything about it. Well, I might have a UN resolution. Now, we're the most powerful country in the world. So it falls to us as a more difficult problem. You know, it's not a difficult problem if you're um, Luxembourgeois. It's a difficult problem if you're American. Less so if you're French, but still serious, if you're French or British. Um, because they have a certain do ability to intervene. So the question to me is, you know, so we, we should go through, when you and I sit in our government offices, um, case after case, where people are being slaughtered. Slaughtered. People are being slaughtered in Syria. And the American reaction has been, no, we just got through a war in Iraq. We're not going to do much about it. I don't think that's an adequate reaction. I just don't think it is. I think it would be great if we could solve this at the UN. I think it would be great if we could solve it in Geneva. We cannot solve it in Geneva. Those talks failed because Iran and Russia and Hezbollah are supporting Assad. So it is a reasonable answer. 
to say, well, in that case, there's nothing we can do. But I would argue it is a reasonable answer to say, but in that case, there's still something we have to do. I just, I guess, I, 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 since he was looking at me, yes. I, I, I think I just should Plus restate my other point. I, 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 I agree with you that, um, that, that we have to respond in Syria far more robustly than we have. My point is that I think our behavior in places like Iraq fundamentally compromises our capacity to do just that. Which are the that, places like Iraq? Um, Afghanistan. Well, I, I think I think Iraq is a is when I I think Iraq is a good example in and of itself. I think that that um, the, this whole concept of the responsibility to protect um, includes this kind of just war concept of right intention, and I think and I, I think this is a question we can ask. Ragi and people like Shibli Talhami, who polls in the Arab world, but I, I uh, but about how the Arab world and how much of the world perceives U.S. intentions when we do intervene. And I think if we if we don't focus really on this issue of right intention, I think we're gonna we, we put a lot of those interests at risk. But but let me just turn to Ragi. Can, can just I, well, I want to ask both of you: Should okay. we have intervened in Darfur with UN backing? I mean, I think that. Basically, intervening unilaterally invites every other power in the world to intervene unilaterally. It, Russia can justify the intervention in Crimea on exactly the same basis that we justify interventions in any place in the world so in which to, we to, feel there is. So if the Russians vetoed in the UN Security Council, you would have been prepared to say, there's nothing we can do about the genocide in Darfur. And I wouldn't. I would have said what Clinton said in the Balkans. I thought we should have done something. And I think it's a reasonable disagreement to have, but I don't, I, I would not agree that sweetness and light is all on your side in that argument. It certainly isn't for the people of Darfur. No, I mean, I, I do actually think there are bases for intervention to protect lives, even if you don't get UN acceptance. Like, for instance, I thought the, the no-fly zones in Iraq over Kurdistan was a justified intervention to protect the Kurds. However, it's a very different sort of intervention from invading a country and removing its leader. Sure. Would you go for a no-fly zone over Syria? I would. I would. I actually advocate for, closer here. for a no-fly zone over Syria. <laughs> yeah, but, but let me, can I just say parenthetically, I, you may have a different opinion. I think it's a great conversation because we're really getting to the differences in yep. the perspective that you have, and frankly, I think Raggy and I are probably more on another side. But these issues of legitimacy mm -hmm. and and um, and and um, you know they're really important, and 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 we have different perspectives about that, and that's quite apparent. But is if unless we have more, should we throw yeah, it out let's, to let's question? open it up, please? Yeah, go ahead. on okay um, and you mentioned that um, we shouldn't support the oppressors um, and I was wondering I guess this is specifically about Egypt um, would you advocate not sending any military aid or reducing our military aid to Egypt either reducing uh, I wouldn't cut it to zero because <clears throat> from an American national interest point of view uh, we want to see them continue to fight the jihadis who are gathering in the region, particularly in Sinai now. So for example, I think you could make a reasonable argument. Look, you Egyptians, you don't need F-16s. That's ridiculous. Helicopters, different story. So I would certainly want to change the mix of the military aid, but I'd also cut it back. Um, this is an unpopular view in Congress, at least it has been so far. But I think if you don't cut it back at all, you run the risk that you seem to be saying everything that's happening there is just Jim Dandy with us, and I don't think it should be fine with us. Yes, please. I want to go back to your uh, original remark about trying to uh, isolate the issue of the... You said, you know, there are Islamic countries that have great democracies, and it seems like to be an Arab problem. And within that, you mentioned the lady that told you in Egypt, I wish yeah. I had 10 years for that. And I, th that's the part that I'm trying to understand. 
Um, my father was born and raised in Egypt. My mom was born and raised in uh, Libya, even so I'm kind of a little bit away from it. But when you were talking about that, about that and about how people are looking for respect and dignity in the Arab... I remember how they talked about the culture, especially the classes culture. I, I don't know if it's the same today, but just in the old days, how a person was born in a class, they're pretty much stuck in a class. And within this class, women even have less rights than men. Here in the West, when we vote and we have democracy, pretty much everybody have the same right, people have the same opportunity. My question is, could it be that what happened in the Arab world and the inability to bring democracy soon has to deal with the culture? How does the culture influence the ability to bring democracy fast? If you don't mind talking about it and help us better understand, because I'm not so sure that in the West a lot of people understand that, well, it's a little bit different there. Yeah, we want them to have the democracy, but how does the culture influence the timing and the ability to get through democracy? Well, it's a very good and very hard question. Um, when we say um, there are a number of Islamic democracies, but there haven't been any in the Arab world, I mean, in a sense, the answer almost uh, tautologically has to be Arab culture. The problem is I don't think it's a helpful answer because then what do you mean Arab culture? I mean, we're saying, well, the Arabs don't have democracy. Why? Because of Arab culture. So we haven't gotten very far. What is it about Arab culture? Um, one argument is it is the, it is the, the position of women. Um, and you're not going to be able to develop real democratic societies until uh, the condition of women, the position of women is changed. I would also point to these conspiracy theories. There are a lot of conspiracy theories floating around. I mean, you look at the popular press. Egypt is a perfect example. Why does it matter? I think it matters because if you believe the government is run by secret hidden forces, what's the point of voting? And what's this democracy nonsense? Um, <clears throat> you'll never be able to control the future anyway. The future is controlled by hidden <laughs> groups and forces. Um, very, I think, damaging to the development of a democratic spirit. Um, I, yet in every Arab society, there are Democrats. There are what we would view as kind of centrist, liberal um, Democrats. There aren't many, pretty weak in most places, stronger in Tunisia. I don't really have the answer to this. And as I have looked at the literature, asking the same question you asked, what do you mean Arab culture? What is it? What explains it? I find it very poor. I, I don't find it a, you know, a wonderful, rich literature that offers 10 wonderful theories, which, all of which may be true. Um, so I don't really have a, a, what I think is a very good answer to this question. We see the phenomenon, the lack of democracy, except for Tunisia. Um, but I think uh, scholarship has been pretty slow to, to explain to us, okay, if it isn't Islam, what is it about the Arab experience? And I, there are theories, you know, colonialism, certainly part of it, uh, Western colonialism, Ottoman colonialism. Um, but um, I haven't seen a very really cogent, persuasive theory. Yeah. Well, let me comment here. I mean, I think the arguments that are based on culture are fundamentally problematic because culture is considered to be something that is essential and unchanging. And therefore, this is a group that will never have democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and it's essentially Orientalist. This is an Orientalist argument that says these people are fundamentally different from us. And therefore, they are the other. It's an othering sort of argument. I think one has to see, well, democracy is a product of history. It's a product of political economy. It's a product of natural resources. It's a product of a variety of different complex features that are all changing over time. And they may not change r right away or the way we want them to change, but they are definitely things that are uh, uh, complex interrelations. One argument for why democracy is more difficult is the role of natural resources. It's well known that when governments get most of their income from a source of rent like natural resources that they control. They don't need to tax their populations and they can bribe their populations into quiescence, into basically not questioning their authoritarian rule. There is an argument called the authoritarian bargain 
which is we're going to take care of you by uh, basically hiring your uh, sons and daughters into the government, by giving you free services and subsidized commodities, so long as you don't question our authority. The authoritarian bargain is alive and well, especially in the natural resource-rich countries. And so culture is a very problematic argument. There are many other complex reasons why democracy does not thrive. May I ask um, um, Elliot a question which is not unrelated to this. During your uh, comments, uh, Elliot, you made a distinction um, uh, between uh, you know, dem uh, a democratic government and Islamist government. And I guess my question is, what, what are your, what should be um, the, 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 the posture of the United States toward a government that describes itself as Islamist? And what are your, what, what would your, um, and, 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 um, and, and this is not irrelevant or not unrelated to the question of what, was, what should have been appropriate U.S. policy toward the Morsi government mm -hmm. in terms of our U.S. expectations about the uh, 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 U.S. expectations about democratic evolution and U.S. engagement. Well, Morsi was democratically elected, so we should definitely have engaged with him open, openly and in a friendly manner until he began to be ruling in a non-democratic manner. And I, you know, to me, the fact that he calls himself an Islamist would not be the test. The test would be, what do you do? So uh, Erdogan in Turkey begins as a Democrat. He is not now a Democrat. And I think we should be protesting, for example, the jailing of uh, journalists and editors in Turkey. Same thing in, uh, I mean, Morsi, just to give an example. There's a law in Egypt that says that if you criticize old law, criticize the king, Go to jail. That was adopted by Nasser. So it was if you criticize the president, it's a crime to go to jail. Nasser never, King Farouk never used it. Nasser never used it. Mubarak used it about three times in 30 years. Morsi began to use it. People were being jailed in Egypt under Morsi for insulting the president. We didn't say anything. I, so my answer would be, I wouldn't look at whether he says he's Islamist or not. I, you know, don't look at the speeches. Look what he's doing. Well, there is a, a theory out there that the reason the Obama administration was quite friendly to an Islamist coming to power democratically in, in Egypt, and in fact tried to speed up the election process right after the revolution, right after uh, the, the January 2011 uh, uprising, uh, knowing full well that elections that happened right away were going to bring the Islamists mm -hmm. to power. And the theory was that, well, uh, the people out in the, in the Middle East and in the Islamic world want Islamist government. So they're calling for them. Either they're going to get them through militancy and they were going to call for al-Qaeda, or they're going to try and get them democratically. And we need to prove to them that they're able to achieve Islamism through democratic processes. And that's why it's OK to, uh, to kind of facilitate the arrival to power of Islamists. What do you think of that theory? I think it's possible. I think it's a possible explanation. I think it, it, it was mistaken in the sense that if, if you compare Egypt and Tunisia, one of the mistakes made in Egypt was to have elections too quickly. Tunisia slowed down the process, constitution first, set the rules of the game, then elections. It seems to work better. Um, you know, what's interesting to me is also the, the, I think it's possible that people in the administration did believe that, but it doesn't seem to be true. Uh, remember, Morsi's victory was 51-49 against General Shafiq, a a, rem a remnant of the old Mubarak regime, the worst possible candidate, you might think, 51-48. So it was pretty close. And then Morsi lost that support uh, pretty quickly. But it is conceivable, quite conceivable to me, that um, that is a a factual uh, account of, of the thinking. Yes, go ahead. There's, a, there's, an, underli there's an underlying um, theme in what we're talking about that troubles me. And that is maybe we used to be the world's greatest power <laughs> until we took the step of uh, or until we decided that it was our role to tell other countries how democracy would form. In other words, 
we have it, and we do such a good job of it, that we know how you should do it. And that's where you get into this culture clash because our democracy and our imposition of our democratic values doesn't fit into the world. So when you talk about intervening on behalf of democracy, what gives us the right to do that? That's part one. Uh -oh. You also mentioned <laughs> democracy needs constitutions. How many countries do we deal with, underwrite, give to, and support, which are neither democratic nor constitutional? By the way, Israel doesn't have a constitution. Well, just on the latter point, you know, the British don't have a constitution either. It, it doesn't mean anything. They have a system of, of, of basic guarantees of rights in both of those countries, England and, and Israel. So I, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's significant. You know, all of these countries, I mean, uh, one of the interesting things that President Abbas, the Palestinian president, did today was to sign a bunch of UN covenants, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the best international covenant on freedom, freedom democracy. Um, we certainly have a right when countries have made all these agreements, they've signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they've signed that covenant to say to them, you're violating the covenant. It's not an invasion, but to say to them, you're violating that, you pledge to do it. You're pledged to freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, free trade unions, freedom of religion, and you're violating all the pledges you made. You didn't have to make the pledges. You made them. Uh, that's what we did in the Helsinki agreement, and we had Helsinki Watch, and we put in that basket three of human rights, and that allowed us to say to the Russians, you pledged this. So, I think we have, any country has, I mean, the right to say, um, and, and saying it is a form of pressure. Our aid is a form of pressure. I mean, nobody has a right to American foreign aid. So as we said in the case of Egypt uh, and other places, um, why would we not wish to do this? Now, sometimes there are reasons, because we have economic interests, military interests. But basically, I think we certainly have the right as a political, diplomatic, rhetorical and economic matter to push. Now, do we push? Well, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. We have a very uneven record. The record's better in the last, you know, 40 years than in the previous period. We're doing more of it, I guess you'd say, since the Carter administration. Um, it's extremely uneven. There are cases where, you know, how hard are we pushing China? Well, we're pushing China. We're not going to break off relations. We're not going to stop trading with China. But every president puts a certain degree of moral pressure on China on human rights questions and tries to get um, dissidents out of jail or sometimes even out of China. Um, I think we can do more of it. Um, I, I think in every administration, it's not just that there are differences between administrations. Within administrations, it rises and falls, depending on who's national security advisor, who's secretary of state, is it the first term or the second term, what's going on in the world. We can do more. And uh, I think there'd be a pretty good amount of support for this. People don't want, we saw this in Syria, people don't, Americans seemed not to want military action in Syria. I think if you ask people, okay, why not talk about military action? Don't you think we should be doing more to prevent? I think, yeah, you'd get a pretty good reaction on that. The argument that you made about military, more military intervention because of human rights violations. Well, I, I would, you know, I don't know if you want to say chemical weapons is just a human rights violation, but I'm confident. Can I prove this? Not at all. I'm confident that if the president had gone ahead and done what he said he was going to do, remember Kerry's two really strong, what I would call war speeches, saying, have you seen those babies laid out on those white sheets? We're not going to permit that. Had the president on Saturday morning gone on TV and said, my fellow Americans, last night, we conducted a series of air strikes on these chemical weapons places and some other military places. We're not going to, I'm not going to allow, we're not going to allow poison gas back. I think the support of the American people would have been very high. I have no way of proving that, but, but I think it would have been. Go ahead. 
Thank you for the talk. I was wondering, you mentioned the Cedar Revolution in 2005. And, um, you know, during, that, during the Bush administration, what were the combination of carrots and sticks that allowed that amazing, you know, turnover and the withdrawal of Syrian occupation troops from an American perspective? And related to that, um, there seems to be a, a popular opinion or mass media op opinion about uh, Bush being heavily reliant on advisors, and uh, he's been very silent since um, you know his term is over. Um, are we getting his perspective basically from folks like yourself and Condoleezza Rice? Or what what is his silence? Related? Let me start with Lebanon. Um, the Cedar Revolution was great. Um, we can't take much credit. The Cedar Revolution was created when the Syrians and or Hezbollah killed Rafiq Hariri. And that is what led to these massive demonstrations which finally led to the end of the Syrian occupation. Uh, we were for it, but the Lebanese did this. Uh, really, I, I wish we could take some credit for the United States. I just I don't think we can. The Lebanese rose up. Um, Bush, it's interesting. Um, Bush's view is that ex-presidents should shut up. I remember him saying, you know, President Carter opposed some of his policies. He told people to vote against us in the UN, thereby damaging the policy the incumbent president was following. And Bush said, I'm never going to do that. I think it's wrong for any president. I don't care how much. You can do it. He would say, I don't care what all of you, you should speak your mind. Presidents are different. Presidents should not criticize their successors. And he's never going to do it in public. I mean, you have dinner with him, he can tell you what he thinks, although he's pretty careful there too. Uh, he just thinks presidents should not do this, ever. And he's never going to do it. He's fine with everybody writing all their memoirs. And he wrote his memoirs. So the closest you'll ever come is the memoir he wrote. But it's just, it's his view that, you know, presidents are unique. You had your time, four years or eight years, go home. I agree, by the way. OK, back there. I'm curious to hear your reaction to the idea. It seems that we think democracy, uh, on some level, maybe starts and ends with casting a vote. But what about the right of a free assembly, a free press, the free freedom of religion, independent judiciary, all of the, that bill of rights that maybe is part of what the one, one speaker picked up on and I picked up on, which is that um, they need to marinate for 10 years in free society with all of its complications, all of its muddiness. Um, and I wonder about the role of all of those freedoms uh, in addition to the opportunity to cast a vote, if you could react to what, sure. what is democracy if you pull back? Well, I, I agree with you. I thought I had uh, made that clear in the remarks, but let me make it clear. It's absolutely right. Natan Sharansky has a great phrase, which is, what's a free election? A free election is an election held in a free society. So that's an argument for the Tunisian way. Elections at the end, when you've worked out some of these other things. I think we should not deprecate elections. Um, they are essential. Uh, people have to have the right to change their government and to hold accountability is part of democracy. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, um, not only do we not believe it's a democracy if there is not freedom of speech, freedom of press, free assembly, free trade unions, and so forth, but um, we don't believe in majority rule as the only consideration. You know, that's why we have a constitution. So um, we, we are not plebiscitarians. We don't believe that elections make democracy. I would say we can't have a democracy without them, but we certainly don't believe that elections make democracy. You're absolutely right. OK, we'll take one more question. Thank you, and, and thank you for the, thank you for the dialogue. Um, We've heard a lot, uh, not only this evening, but um, since the last two elections in particular about President Bush and about some of his uh, perceived 
uh, failures and, and policy problems. Uh, we currently have a different president, and that president has, uh, has currently the role of president and leader, leader of the free world. There are many of us who feel that he is not doing an excellent job, but we hear far, far, far less about his issues and his problems, even though those are being dealt with now in not a very wonderful way, whereas President Bush is no longer president. Now, we've heard some of this again this evening, and this is a theme. This is something that uh, just seems to continue, and it's, it's sort of fascinating, but I, I'd like each of your perspectives on that, including the hosts, and uh, I spent some time at this university, and it, political correctness here is not something that is unheard of. It's something that uh, permeates quite distinctly everything that I see. And um, I think that we are a lot better off with forums like this where we allow people to speak, speak their minds and speak the truth. Let me, I'll, I'll speak last and then, oh, okay. Well, the only problem I have in addressing your question or comment is that I can speak for approximately eight hours without stopping on the failures and problems of the Obama administration. And it's too late in the evening to, um, to do that. Uh, <laughs> I, um, it is striking to me, and I, and I think there's a bias at work here, and I think it's partly in most of the press led by the New York Times. I think it's partly the academic world, and we all know poll after poll after poll every four years, uh, 95, 97, 98 percent of professors voting Democratic. It's partly the president, that is to say President Obama, who I think more than any previous president has kept on blaming his predecessor, which is normal actually at the beginning. Just about every president thinks the guy who came before was no damn good, even if it was from the same party. Um, but you figure that's the first year. It's not the fifth year and the sixth year. And it's decreasingly persuasive, I think, as, as time goes by. Um, I would say this. President Obama arrived in office on an avalanche of goodwill around the world. Remember before, uh, his speech in Berlin? It's fantastic. Huge crowds, adulatory crowds. Um, and he's dissipated it in Israel, in the Arab world, in Europe, in Asia. He has dissipated it. They have come to the conclusion that, number one, he doesn't much like talking to them because they were used to Clinton and Bush, who did like talking to them. Um, and number two, uh, they have the impression that he is trying to withdraw the United States from exercising its power as the leading democratic country. They have the impression not that this is an unfortunate result he's coping with, but rather that it is a policy objective. Um, a reaction to the Bush administration by the new president, let's diminish the military budget. Let's pull out of everywhere. That's the impression you get. And you get a lot of reactions to it. You saw it in the president's visit to Saudi Arabia. You see it in Asia, where all of the countries around China are clamoring for a greater American presence and worrying they're not going to get it. So um, I think it, it, it's, um, I think he gets away with a lot. I think he gets away with it largely because of the press. And I will give you one example, and then I'll, I'll stop. The president was interviewed a few days ago by Scott Pelley on the NBC Evening News. And Scott Pelley said to him what I said to Eric. You look at those people being slaughtered in Syria. Don't you regret your decision back last summer not to do that strike? And the president replied, um, well, after 10 years of war, our troops need a breather. Whoa, what troops? That was a one-day airstrike that John Kerry said was going to be, quote, unbelievably small, close quote. But nobody in the press says, wait a minute, what's he talking about? That's misleading. What, where did that come from? What kind of defense is that of what he said last year? I think he gets away with it. And I think he gets away with it largely because of uh, media bias. Well, well, I'll leave it up to I'll leave it up to Dean Schwartz to defend President Obama, but all I'm going to say is that I actually was 
quite critical of the Obama administration in the way it reacted to the Arab Spring and its reading of the Arab Spring as being, uh, this is our chance to promote Islamist mm. Democrats. And I think that reading was completely false and it ended up in a much more difficult transition in Egypt than could have been the case had they been given, had they given the chance of democratic forces to be able to organize themselves and write a constitution and be able to compete fairly in an election. Hmm. So. Um, let, me, um, let, uh, let me comment on your, on your points in question and then I'll, I'll, I'll um, thank our guests and, and all of you for coming. Um, well, there's been a lot of conversation at the Humphrey School in the past week or two about diversity of perspectives at the University of Minnesota. Uh, whether it's the visit of Elliot Abrams or the visit of Condoleezza Rice. And, um, and I'm quite proud of uh, our efforts to ensure that there is a diversity of perspectives that we present at this institution. Um, our legacy and our namesake is Hubert Humphrey. Um, uh, but, um, but this institution has no political party affiliation. Um, I, I think that um, we don't have to, we, we don't, I don't think we have to um, prompt Elliot Abrams too much to get him to talk about the Obama administration, uh, as, you just, as you just heard. But I also frankly think that, you know, Elliot is a significant and substantial figure uh, in the foreign policy uh, a community, um, representing an, a critically important part of the Republican Party, not the only part of the Republican Party. And so I think it's completely appropriate um, for us to be talking with Elliot, not about the Obama administration, but about the perspectives that he brought to bear um, uh, um, when he served, because that's the most valuable thing we can get, I, from my, my personal uh, view, from, this, from, from his conversation, from, from talking to him. And frankly, this is exactly the kind of discussion I had hoped we were going to have, because I can tell you that the issues of disagreement, uh, the issues of dispute, they've all been aired. Um, I'm sure there are others. Um, and in fact, we spoke less about uh, the, 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 the prospects in the context of the Arab Spring than we did about US policy. And that's probably appropriate as well, because after all, we are a school of public policy. Um, so I, I feel, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy you've come. I think, that, I think the conversation was rich, rewarding, and it wasn't, and, 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 and most of all, we didn't agree on a whole lot of things, and that's exactly the way it should be. So I thank you for your comment, and, and it's something that we think about a lot. Um, I also want to thank my colleague, Raghi Assad, for, for joining us tonight. Um, I want to thank Elliot for making the trip. I want to thank all of you for being here this evening, and I look forward to seeing you all again uh, real soon uh, at the Humphrey School. Thanks again. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> That was great. Thanks, Thanks man. Yeah. Yeah.